Well, hello again, slurds. Welcome back to the Cheers to Comics podcast. I am your host, Brian Wayne, and this is an incredible creator corner. Uh, This is the first ever creator corner featuring a Marvel creator. Yep, we're we're at that level now, motherfuckers. Uh, Yeah, Uh, needless to say, I'm more than excited to, to, to share this podcast with you. I had a great time talking with Matthew Rosenberg. Yes, that's the guy, in case you didn't look at the the episode name for whatever reason. Yep, that's who we're talking to this time. We talk about all type let's let's just get on with this, huh? Let's let's see what old Matthew Rosenberg had to say. How are ya? I'm doing good, how you doing? Man, I'm I'm excellent. I'm so excited. We uh we I think I think we're official. We've got a we've got a not just any Marvel writer on the on the podcast now. We've got Matthew Rosenberg. That's me. Uh, that that that's you. I've probably uh, I've spoken your name quite often throughout the the duration of this podcast, mostly on uh, on account of the Punisher being the greatest thing that's happened to that character ever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're we're definitely going to talk Punisher. We're going to talk a lot of stuff, man. You've been impressive this year. This has been the year of Rosenberg for sure. You could easily be in consideration for Writer of the Year. There's no doubt about it. Well, thank you. I so, I I would respectfully disagree, but I I appreciate it. Oh man, I don't know. There's <laughs> there's been there's been some good stuff. That's for sure. And some I mean, uh, undoubtedly and arguably brilliant stuff. I mean, the stuff that no one out there could deny is just perfect. So you've, you. uh, so without all of that, I mean, all of that aside, I appreciate. I know you're a busy guy, and you've got some stuff you want to talk about. Some stuff I want to know about. That's for damn sure. Sure. And uh, yeah, but I, I before we get into what's now, I just kind of want to pick your brain a little bit and know what why Matthew Rosenberg is Matthew Rosenberg. So I kind of want to just rewind just a little bit. And tell me what what was it that you were reading at what point in your childhood? Was it a childhood? Were you a late into comics kind of guy? What were your influences that made you realize this is what I want to do with my life? Yeah, so um, that's sort of a I I have knowing a lot of comics writers now. It's funny because I have a sort of different origin story than a bunch because I. I mean, I learned to read on comics like literally stealing my older brother's X Men comics when I was three four years old and like sounding out words so uh you know I, I learned to read on them i grew up with a comic shop on my block it was like the one place i was allowed to go like i had to cross one street and my mom was like you can cross that street alone to go to the comic shop um you know and i'd go there and i wouldn't have money and i would just go there and just like look around and look at stuff i i think i probably looked through every back issue in the bins just like held it up looked at it sort of tried to memorize it um so that was like a, a second home for me. So like, yeah, I mean, I, I just comics was a big part of my life from, you know, as far back as I can remember. But I never thought about making comics. I just didn't, I can't draw at all. So it, it was never something that really, you know, seemed like something to do. And it, it, I, comics was very solitary for me. I didn't have a lot of friends who read comics. It was very much something I did on my own. Um and I, and I it still is I still like I'm kind of you know like I, I I'm out here and talking about comics and promoting comics and I have social media and stuff but like at the end of the day like it's 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 sort of my my escapism is is comic books so um but yeah I, I just at a certain point I was I was I was working in the music business and and you know doing all sorts of odd I ran a record label and I you know tour managed bands and did all this stuff and I was just kind of getting burned out on it. And, and I hit a point where I was like, I, I'm starting to hate music. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. And I was like, I need to do something else with my life. I need to find something else. And I was like, the only other thing I love is as much as music is comics. And I was like, I guess I'm going to try and make comics. But I didn't have any idea how to make comics, what that entailed. So I just sort of dove into the deep end and and went from there. So like it's a very weird, you know, like I talked to a lot of comics writers who were like, yeah, at age 10 I started writing my first comics and I was like, no, man, I was like 30. See, uh, that's that's awesome to hear, man. That's inspiring for a lot of people. That's a big reason why I do these things. I mean, I still want uh, 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 stories like that. You know, people say I'm too old. 
Hell no, man. 30 years old, you're getting into it. And I mean, you're you're not just, you know, doggy paddling up there, dude. You're you're a big dog at Marvel. I mean, yeah, so yeah. that's that's inspiring for sure. Yeah, it's very it's very weird because when I started making comics, I like early on I was like, you know, I I, I should set sort of goals and career goals and you know, I spent a bunch of years like self-publishing and pitching that went nowhere and doing web comics and stuff like that. But I was like, you know, my goal is to be a Marvel writer. Like, that's what I wanted. And then, like, once you're there, it's like one of those weird things where you're like, oh, I'm, I'm doing the thing. Like, now I need new goals. I need new, I need to reevaluate because you sort of, it's, you know, but but in the same way, like, yeah, I, I hope in some ways that it is inspirational to people because, like, yeah, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't, I don't know how to draw. I didn't spend any time trying to do comics my whole life it's not it i like you know you could be me and have read comics for six months and if you're like i love it i want to do it like do it try it uh, right on man that's awesome that's so awesome what was your breakout book with marvel um well my first i had some indie books that marvel sort of caught their attention and then i did a 10 page short for them in secret wars journal um gotcha. number one that was like an x-men story and then i did Right after that wrapped, they were like, do you want to do a, a Quake one-shot? There was like It was like the 50th anniversary of S.H.I.E.L.D. And they were like, do you want to do that? And I said, yeah. And then they sort of benched me for like six months because they were, you know, just I had a lot of stuff going on. And then in that six-month time, I, I started doing, I did a thing for DC and I was talking to DC more. And uh, Marvel came back and was like, uh, Civil War II is happening and... Um, you know, I think I think Brian Bendis was a, a fan of some of my creator on stuff, which was like, you know, kind of mind blowing. And and I knew a bunch of editors at Marvel, and they were like, oh yeah, Brian is like mentioned your name in a meeting as someone who could do stuff. So they they came to me and they were like, you know, uh, Will Moss, who's a, one of the best editors in comics, came to me and he was like, we're gonna do a villain book in Civil War Two, and I was like, awesome. And he was like, do you have a villain you'd want to do? And I was like, Kingpin. And he was like, perfect, let's go. And so that's, you know, where we went. Because Kingpin's my favorite villain in the Marvel Universe. Like, one of my favorite characters in all of fiction. And so, yeah, I mean, my first book was was that. And I sort of hit the ground running there. That, that, that's amazing. I mean, we've, uh, we, we've talked about Kingpin off the mic before. And I, I enjoy Kingpin in the same manner. I think he's one of the greatest things to ever happen to, to, to just fiction in general absolutely um so uh wh why this strikes with me is because uh my reintroduction back into comics was during civil war ii okay. and uh there was a big going out of business type of thing it's some massive uh hastings was going oh. out of business and they were i was getting comics for 90 percent off i walked out with a hundred comics i spent like fourteen dollars it was ridiculous yeah. well in that it was during the civil war ii event and all four kingpin books were in there and i've oh. always loved kingpin so your stuff was some of the first stuff that i read oh wow and i didn't realize that was your inner your your breakout into marvel so the, I've, I've i could actually say i've been following you from the beginning of your marvel career since the very first time i've been reading Con that's pretty cool to learn right now yeah yeah that was my first i did the civil war kingpin and two so issues in they were like we love this. Would you want to do more Kingpin? And I was like, yes. And so they immediately were like, okay, we're going to come out of this with a Kingpin book. And then within a month, I was doing Rocket Raccoon and that and uh, Secret Warriors and then just kind of, uh, you know, been doing three or four books a month ever since. Well, it's awesome because you could do a character like Rocket who is very much not like Kingpin at all. So you could be right. funny and humorous and you could be dark and brooding at the same time and just really horrific and on yeah. a level that marvel kind of they tiptoe around uh, sure. you know, i i know that <laughs> there's there's some stuff that you've written for sure where i was surprised that marvel let it go because you know there's yeah <laughs> uh, you, it, you know how to bring kingpin the way he should be brought yeah yeah in kingpin and also uh in um the punisher mm. uh i got i got <laughs> my my editors in King, on oh. kingpin sure will and and Mark Basso and and Mark Panicia and and Jake Thomas like they're they're some of the, the great editors in comics, and and Jake Thomas who's the Punisher editor and I did twenty seven issues of the Punisher with him and uh, he's just amazing. He said to me once when I was starting on Punisher he was like uh, he was like you're censoring yourself and I was like well it's a Marvel book and he was like no your job is to try and get things by me 
And he was like, it's my job to stop you. He's like, you That's go awesome. as hard as you can, and I'll tell you when it's too hard. And, and so, That's like, how a punish editor should be, man. Yeah, Jake is the best. And, and so we were, you know, there's a lot of Punisher pages on the, on the cutting room floor, because he was like, you cannot do this. You cannot do this. <laughs> Stuff where, like, when it came out, I was like, man, Jake, I can't believe we did that. And he was like, I'll be honest, I was a little shocked we did it, too. And I'm like, all right. Well, glad you did it every time, man. Gla- oh, every okay. time, I'm glad you did it. I, I, I'm not... This uh, as this last run was Punisher. I will go ahead and say when I do my yearly whatever, when I say Marvel's book of the year, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there's no question. There's there's no uh, there's a there's a second and a third, but it's a distant man. Uh, what right. you and Simon and Antonio did was just next level comic telling, and I've never seen a, a character captured so well. It is my number one most recommended book to anybody that comes at me and says, I want a Marvel character. I give them Punisher, they're like, what are you talking about? And I say, read it, and they come back at me, and I say, where's volume two? And well, it, it's never failed. I'm not lying, man. I probably I probably owe you a a, a royalty check then for for no, doing that. by no means. I'm happy to. This is what I'm here for, man. This is what I'm I'm here to put comics in other people's hands. This is well, <laughs> um, the whole point of this podcast. But I I have to thank you personally because I really do enjoy that run, and because thank of that, you. I have something to always be excited about with that character. Thank you. And then what more? I mean, and then they had to, they had to come big with the next Marvel guy or with the next Marvel book. They had to like, okay, Rosenberg kill it. We got to go back to Warren, man. <laughs> There's no way anybody's gonna read Punisher again after this yeah, unless yeah. it's someone like Warren Ellis. So you yeah. you, t- you truly set the standard for sure. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's it's uh, you know, I, I the Punisher is a, it's a weird book because I I love the Punisher as a kid and and. There are so many Punisher runs that like mean the world to me, and I had like Punisher Mike Zek Punisher poster on my bedroom door as a kid, and it's just not the book that I ever thought I would be writing like 27 issues of. And when I finished, I was like, oh, you know, like Marvel got me a, a Punisher, like a really nice Punisher watch and stuff. And I that's awesome. Man. And I was rapping, and I was like, oh, it's really touched. And but it's it's a it, it's interesting to to have that be like a big part of my legacy because it's not. It's not something that I, I saw coming, and I, you know I'm very proud of the work on the book and stuff. And so, as, as well, you should be, man. And like your art, the art team, yeah, <laughs> it also just oh, dude, fucking killed it, man. I, killed yes, it. And what I, was, I was just saying to someone recently, I was like, yeah, you know, like they were like, oh yeah, Simon and Antonio, so good. And I was like, yeah, also we're like the only book at Marvel that had 17 consecutive issues with no fill-ins, and. I think I don't know if we're the only book in the last few years that's done that. There might be one or two others, but we're the only book that shipped more than an issue a month. Like we did seventeen yeah. issues in thirteen months, I think, with mm-hmm. them. Yeah, and Simon that's just yeah, so fast and like to be doing work like that is is unreal. I you know I said that to people and I was like, people always talk about like they don't want they want consistent artists. I was like, we we did seventeen issues in thirteen months with no fill in artists, no no nothing. It was just Simon doing it, just Antonio. So. Yeah, I was very lucky to work with them. They're they're awesome. Right on, man. No, that's you you you're killing it all year. Uh, other things that you've done that I've enjoyed. Uh, your 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 stamp on X Men, on your uncanny was fucking brilliant, dude. I loved I loved every bit, every single bit of it. Every every time you killed someone, I let out of an aud- an audible grunt because I knew that whatever was coming with Hickman was going to be fucking perfect and you were yeah. setting it all up because you you had no problem killing everyone because you I mean you obviously yeah. knew something. No, no, yeah, I knew I knew what John, like Jonathan was hired to do House of X and Powers of 10 before I got right game, before me and Kelly and Ed had it. So we knew what he was doing and what we were going to and um you know sort of my marching orders were like this is the end of an era. Like Jonathan's bringing in a new era. Uh, how does the era end? And like they were like, we want it to go to a dark place so Jonathan can bring it out into light. And I was like, all right. And they were like, go dark. And I was like, all right. That's and so then awesome. and then I turned it in. And they were like, that was really dark. And I was like, <laughs> but you know, I, I grew up on on the Chris Claremont stuff, and it's like those books to me. X Men as a kid was like, you know, I read Avengers and I read. Defenders and Champions and all these other books that I that I loved and um you know there's uh, there's all these different Marvel comics that Fantastic Four that that I, I really cared about but the X Men felt like a different book like the 
other books are characters fighting to save the world, and the X Men, while they are saving the world, are also just fighting to survive in the world. And like Chris Claremont's run, especially, had a great sense of like, oh, I don't, I don't know if they're going to be here next month. Like, I don't know if they're all going to make it. And in a very real, tangible way, it, it just like, I, I just as a kid remember reading it, and like every month, like kind of holding my breath and being like, oh, they, you know, they killed this person, and like, oh, this person's depowered, and this person's in a coma, and like they're gone and and it was very real and and the stakes were very real and so i i sort of wanted to nod back to that and um do a love letter to that stuff in in a big way so um yeah there's a there's a very big sense of doom in the book because that was what was you know i knew that we were going to have a rebirth coming and we knew we were going to have jonathan come in and and make everything new and shiny so i was like well this is you know, this is the X-Men going down fighting, so. Well, has anybody apologized to you? Because I know that a lot of people owe you a lot of apologies. <laughs> that's that's for sure. I know that, that well, your run on here pissed off a lot of really uh, impatient people. Yeah. And... I, 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 one, I would say, I don't think anyone owes me an apology, per se. Sure. Oh, um, they do. But, oh, they do. I'm going to speak for the fans. Yes. Yes, we owe um, you an apology. <laughs> no, it is funny, because I've had a lot of people, when when some of the reveals in House of X and Powers of Ten started coming, people started reaching out to me and being like, oh. And, like, some of them are very, like, cautious. And they're like, did you know? And I was like, yeah, I've known for years. Like, Jonathan, sat in a room with Jonathan while he walked me through it. And then I went, left the room and started working on what I was going to do. And they're like, that's cool. <laughs> and like, they get it now that I'm like, yeah, it's not just random, crazy, like, oh, I hate the X-Men kind of thing. Like, I love the X-Men. They're my favorite characters in the in all of comics. And um, so, yeah, it's it, it, there's a lot of sort of interesting conversations about it now. You know, it doesn't, it, it, it will, I will say in a lot of fans' defense that like we structured things differently than a lot of books. Like a lot of times you don't know what comes next and it's the writer who comes next job to sort of work with what you leave behind. Whereas I knew what was coming after me and it was my job to lead up to it. So like there was a different, we were going for a different feeling. Like I wanted to take advantage of the fact that like Jonathan had a way to bring people back. Like Jonathan had a way to like reposition people and change things and do things. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of that because I'm in a very unique position of like, I can kill these people and it doesn't screw over the next writer. It's not like, I'm handing someone a book being like, sorry, all the X-Men are dead. Enjoy writing X-Men. Like he, I can hand him the book and be like, the X-Men are all dead. And he's like, that's fine. And, and so that was a very unique opportunity in comics and making comics that I, you know, we all really wanted to play with. Um, so I, I understand sort of a, a lot of the fan reaction would be like, what is happening? Like he's leaving the book with all of them dead because I knew what was coming when often that isn't the case. So like it, it is a unique set of circumstances in comics for sure. Well, uh, you've 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 proven more than anyone. If you want to play this game, you have to have thick skin, like a rhino man. I don't know if there's anyone that I've I've seen you know put up with more Twitter. Fucking, you've been throwing those punches right back, and I love it. If anything, you don't throw the punches; you just absorb them. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I love about it, and that's how you deal with it. You absorb them. You would do it very well and generously and very uh, diplomatically, and it's it's enjoyable. It's all the more reason to respect what you do. Well, thank you. You know, my feeling, you know, I say this a lot, like uh, comics writers, like if you write for Marvel and DC, you get, you know, if you write some of the characters, like you're going to get a couple death threats, you're going to get people who threaten you, you're going to get people who are just cursing you out and super upset. And I said once to a bunch of the writers, I was like, look, you know, uh, no one wants to be hurting feelings. No one wants people to be upset. No one wants, I mean, no one wants death threats. Like no one wants any of that. But at the same time, like, we have jobs and we can exist and do this because people feel so strongly about these characters and this universe and these things. And I was like, and this is the other side of that. Like people are so passionate about the X-Men and the Avengers and Captain America that, you know, they take it personally. And, and I understand that. Like I, it makes, you know, like that's not how I am. Like I, I see things from the other side cause I'm a writer and like I, I understand that a writer's job is to put put these characters through their paces and try and take them to some place and bring them back and show why they're a hero and why they're someone we can look up to and and you know why they're important. But I also understand that people are going to take these things personally because these characters mean so much to them. But it's those same it's that same mentality that keeps us all in jobs. It's that same mentality that keeps publishers alive and comic shops open. Like. Um, so I, you know, I, I never fault people really for getting super upset. I, I get it. Um, 
people are very invested in the stuff. And, you know, I am too. Like, I'm a lifelong... I'm right. reading the same characters I, I read when I was four years old because I, I really do care about them. So I, I, I get it. I'm never, I never get mad when people are upset with me. I'm always just like, yeah, sorry. Let's, you know, okay, you can vent now. And then, you know, there's a certain point where I'm like, okay, we're done. <laughs> like, I'm not your therapist. You can go talk to someone else. But yeah, I don't, I don't right. mind too much the people letting me know. And, you know, I think, it, I, I think as a writer, I think it's an interesting opportunity. Like, we live in an interesting time where, like, I am getting direct feedback on stories in a very real way and seeing what works for people and what doesn't. And like, you know, there's people who are like, I don't like this, you should fix it. And it's like, well, that's not how stories or art or any of this right. works. But there is a sort of sense of like, well, seeing what connects with people and what doesn't and what means a lot to people. Like a lot of times the books are already in motion and, and stuff and plans are along the way. But like, I think it's an interesting, it's a very democratic idea of criticism in a, in a very interesting way and I think like ignoring it is is not taking full advantage of like the very unique time we live in so uh, well I think it's very well said well said man <laughs> um <Thanks>. well <laughs> geez well uh yeah no that's all the more reason to I mean this <laughs> part of the reason I wanted to do this specifically was to uh and if there were anybody any doubters out there still man I knew you were just gonna shut it all down and prove prove you know you are you're you're doing this. You you love this on the same level that we do. You just you yeah. have a different side of it, and I mean you you you're doing your job. You do have certain boundaries you have to stay within at the same time. And I mean I like that's the cool thing about all this is it's all part of the same universe too. Yeah. yeah. So regardless of people say oh, I want you to do this, well you may know that well so and so and this is going to meet eventually in a couple sure. of years. So this doesn't make sense to do this. So. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, I mean you deal with it so well because I do follow you close. I wouldn't say I stalk you on Twitter, but I follow you pretty close. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, the, the funny thing for me was a lot of like watching. There was sort of an interesting a bit of criticism and like some of the books where people were like, oh, you know, um, this this team is like this and and this is this and we'd like to see more of like this certain thing, especially in X Men. Like fans are very vocal about what they'd like to see and very specific. And it was funny because we were working, I was working very closely with the Age of X-Men team. Like the Age of X-Men came out of me and Kelly and Ed's story. And it was something that like we sort of began to conceptualize. And then Zach Thompson and Lottie Nadler like fleshed out. And then all the other writers came in, and, you know, uh, Vita and, and Leah and, and Tim Seeley and all them came in. And, uh, you know, people were like, on my case about like who my roster of X-Men was. And I was like, but the characters you want, like so many of the X-Men are in books, like with age of X-Men that I was like, people were like, why isn't storm on your team? And I was like, because I gave storm to this other writer who wanted storm. Like we're, we're being very diplomatic and sharing in the books. And people were like, well, I want them here. And it's like, well, you don't get to pick where you want them. But it, it was funny to see like, all these people who were like, I want to see this character, and I just have to be like, you have to be patient. Like, that character will appear in someone else's book. Like, there's a plan. And obviously there's some who don't, because there's a lot of X-Men. But, like, it was a funny moment to just, like, be facing people be like, you're just doing the Cyclops and Wolverine show. And I, like, oh. <laughs> I loved your Cyclops and Wolverine show, man. I well, thought it was great. <laughs> thank you. But, you know, I, I knew at the same time, like, you know, like, I, I know that, like, you know, Vito really wanted to do a, a big bishop thing, and and like you know, Zach wanted to do Zach and Lonnie wanted to do this, and and Leo wanted to do this with these characters, and it's like, well, we all work together to like do things we were passionate about, and so like, I'm not not giving you a storm story, I'm not not giving you a, you know, whoever you love Nightcrawler story because someone else is doing it, like a, you know, so that that's always a funny moment because. Uh, you know, there's a bigger picture that that we're privy to that other people aren't. So it's it's funny to, ha you know, how much you can say and how much you have to kind of be like, just wait, please be patient. There's right. always time. But uh, who is? Uh, who, I gotta know. I was. I've. This is a question I've wondered for a while. Who is your favorite mutant to kill? To I didn't like killing any of them. <laughs> um, no. The uh, no. I, I mean, I love them. It was hard. Uh, uh, the one that. The you know I would argue that magic doesn't actually technically die. Um, she sort of she disappears, but she's not dead at the end of the book. Um, but havoc for me, havoc and magic was... are like my two favorite X Men. And 
uh, Havoc was a big moment for me. And, I, you know, I wish I had more space to give it, but we had a lot of story to cram in at the end. Um, but I think like, it was my favorite moment of the entire run, to be honest, was Havoc's okay. death. It, w- it really was my favorite moment of the whole run. Thank you. You know, like, I, I, he's a favorite of mine, and, like, you know, he turned him into a villain, and his brother died, and all this stuff happened to him, and I was like, I just want him back. And, and so I did Astonishing, and, like, I was like, this is Havoc. Oh, ha- man. That was yeah. <laughs> the, the, I was like, this is Havoc trying to be the good, the good, trying to be his brother and, and falling short and then realizing that, like, you know, there's a way he can be the hero and it's not by trying to be the hero. It's by just doing the right thing. And, um, and like, you know, he learns that lesson and he goes into it. And, and you know, I, I, I wrote the scene in Uncanny 12, I guess it is, when Cyclops saves him and, you know, he doesn't he's surprised that Cyclops is alive and he says, you know, uh, he says, am I dead? He's being tortured. And he was like, am I dead too? And Cyclops is like, no, you're okay. We're both okay. And Havoc just says, it should have been me. Like I should have died. I'm sorry. And like that to me was like a really heavy moment because I knew that like in the end, he was going to sacrifice himself to save Cyclops. That was my plan. And like that, payoff from like 12 to 20 it, it's 22 but it's with the war of the realm stuff it's really 25 or whatever but like you know to go that 13 or so issues to to have that moment pay off was like uh, felt really cathartic to me that was sort of a moment that was very major to me yeah well it was it, like i said it hit me with me real hard too man and that it was it was well done so it wasn't just it wasn't just for you, if that if that means anything to you. It <laughs> resonates with everyone. I appreciate that. Um, well, so you've been with uh, Marvel Hit and Heavy for three and a half, four years approximately? Yeah, I guess. And then they give you an event. You've got Annihilation Scourge, man. What's yes. it like dealing with an event at Marvel? Um you know, it's uh, it's fun. It, we, you, you know, like the 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 original Annihilation is a favorite book of mine. Like it's an, it's one of my favorite events. Um, and this was early on. We didn't know what it was, like what it was going to be. Like uh, Darren, my editor, was like the uh, he was like, you know, do you want to write the whole thing? And I was like, maybe because I sort of couldn't wrap my head around. <laughs> Because I was like, early on, I was like, yeah, I want to do an alpha. And I think they came to me and were like an alpha and an omega issue and then four issues in between. And and I don't actually remember. It might have been Darren or, or one of the other editors who was like, they're all one shots. But I had the idea that like they're not linear, that they're all sort of pieces of a puzzle that come together. And I was like, you know, I, I want them to sort of be readable in any order and like each one has a clue to what's going on in a bigger way. Um and so working all that out and then they were like, do you want to write the whole thing? And I got real scared about like being able to walk other writers through it. Cause I was like, this is a lot to sort of process and figure out how to like coordinate a bunch of other people. And, and then I was like, they were like, yeah, you know, we want, we want other people involved. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, it was a lot of work. We sort of came in late and had to hit the ground running and, and then, you know, they were like, it's going to be Christos Gage and, and Dan Abnett and Mike Maurice and uh, those are all writers whose stuff I love and really respect. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was very reassuring. And then it was awesome to see, like, I came in with sort of a bare bones idea of like, these are the things we need to happen. This is how I see it working. And see those guys just take it and run with it and make them their own and throw out things where I was like, no, we need that. And they were like, no, no, I have something better that does the same thing. And it it comes back and you're like, oh, that is better. Like, that's awesome. Uh, It's been really fun. It's, it's a different kind of uh, comic book making, but it's, it's one I really love. And, and like, it's much more of a team sport uh, than I'm used to. And so that was awesome to see. Well, it's, it's fun to watch readers react to it because it's, it is a very kind of weirdly structured thing. Well, I, I enjoy the way it's structured very much because, you know, you could just read the Fantastic Four. Then you could go back and just read the, the Alpha and then you can yeah. go ahead and read the Nova. And then we got Beta Ray Bill coming up soon. And, Beta Ray Bill, uh, Silver Surfer. Or and Silver Surfer, yep. yeah. yeah. And then the Omega. Um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, I mean, we want, I said, my marching orders were, were clear. I was like, look, I, I, some people are just Silver Surfer fans. They don't want to read six issues. Like, Give them a Silver Surfer story that's cool. Like, give them a Fantastic Four story that's cool. And I think, you know, everyone did that. Like, every book, uh, 
with the exception of maybe Nova, Nova is sort of the least satisfying as a standalone. Like, if you're just a Nova fan, it ends on kind of a bummer note for Nova. Yeah, it's it's uh it's it's rough, man. It, it was, uh, but uh, still, oh man, it's. Uh, it's, you still got to read it. That's for damn sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really proud of it, and I think the stuff that comes in the upcoming issues, the last three issues, people are going to see some of what we were doing, and and it makes more sense, and it ties together in an interesting way. But yeah, I mean, I, a big thing was like, yeah, I mean, we want Fantastic Four fans who are not going to want to read five more issues to be able to read a Fantastic Four book. Like, we, I don't I don't want to make something where it's like you have to you like the Fantastic Four, well, you have to read these six issues to get one fan, one issue of fantastic four. Um, I, I think like, you know, the fans are, uh, you know, <laughs> the fans deserve to buy what they want to buy and read what they want to read. And so I, I was like, let's make something where they can take it apart and order it piece by piece if they want. Um, and, and well, I think it's very it, respected. Um, that's for sure. I mean, I, I really do respect that because I know a lot of people can gripe and, you know, say, oh, these events, they just drive, you know, they just want all your money. But no, you've proven that that's not what you're after is you're 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 leading this event. No, you don't want to just say, well, I'll, I, I want to sell all of the books. No, you want to make sure that you people get what they want and they're satisfied yeah, yeah. with what they get. Yeah, I think I think you can get a you know, you can get four satisfying one shots if you like those characters uh you know if you want to read more like you can if you just want to like little event like the bookends the alpha and omega or a story but like if you want to really know the whole thing and like answer all the questions it's like well you read all six but yeah i mean i think i think it's a it, it's hard to do a book like this it was a lot of work and a lot of planning to sort of structure it like this but um yeah i i, I do think you know especially stuff like this you rope in a lot of characters and you've got a lot of fans who are who are there out of a sense of obligation, not out of a sense of wanting to be there. And like, I always want the people who read my books to want to be there. Um, I know that asking for, I mean, those books are 30 pages, so they're like, what, $4.99? Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, five bucks is a lot of money to ask for someone. And to, and to be like, yeah, you want to read 30 pages of Fantastic Four, you got to lay down five bucks six times. Like, that's a really big ask. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I worked at a job where, you know, you go to the comic shop when you're done with your paycheck and you're like, you're counting your books being like, well, I guess this book, I like it, but it just doesn't quite make the cut. Like I've been there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I try and always make a book where like, you know, you, you get your money's worth is my goal. Um, well, I don't think you've missed missed yet man not since i've been reading yeah that's for okay. damn sure I, every, every everything's been spot on. i can't wait to see how this whole this whole scourge event ends this cosmic adventure horror i mean it's got a, just a little bit of comedy in there but there's a whole lot of action especially in this nova man these these uh splash pages and these spread two page spreads of just yeah. violence oh it's, yeah. beautiful. it's beautiful uh the last issue has a, like a two page spread that is my favorite maybe one of my favorite things I've ever done at Marvel and I think people are going to lose their minds when I see it and I, I told everyone I was like do not leak this do not put this online do not tease this do not show a panel of the you know do not show a, a portion of this to anyone and I was like I don't want to see this in an ad like let's just really keep it under wraps so there's a thing coming up in two weeks in, in Omega that I, I think uh, we go epic and big and, and cool and, and like the art it just it, you know, the art just uh, goes way past what I was hoping for, and it's just beautiful, and and I think people are gonna really love it. So, we go out with we go out with a real big bang. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, is this something that's gonna you know change the perspective of Marvel in a in a you know in a broad sense, or is this? I mean, are we talking? It's it's it, you're definitely gonna feel the effects in the cosmic stuff going forwards. Um, there's definitely right like ramifications. I know that you know we can't talk about some of it, but like definitely Guardians is a book where like at the end of Annihilation, like where the Guardians are and what the Guardians are doing is is a big part of it. And um, you know it's it's uh, uh, we wanted this sort of idea that like. You know, the the original Annihilation book, you know, there's a war coming to space and there's all these infrastructure to sort of, there's all these safety nets to protect the universe. There's, you know, the Nova Corps and the, um, the Kree and the Shi'ar and all these forces that sort of keep us safe from, from the things beyond. And those things have all broken and disappeared and gone away. And this is sort of the fight that makes everyone realize, like, we don't have any protection anymore. Like, we're wide open to things that are coming. 
so I think, yeah, there, there are definitely going to be some ways you feel this going forward in the next year or two. Um, some of it is going to be a little ways off. There are going to be a couple things where you're like, in a year and a half, two years, you're going to be like, oh, in places you don't expect, you'll, you'll see things where you're like, oh, that was because of annihilation. And yeah, um, dude, I got my brain bouncing around all in my head right now trying to figure all this stuff. Dude, I'm so excited. I'm trying to figure out all the possibilities of things it could be, especially when you mentioned the Guardians specifically. I mean, I know Joe Bedden's getting ready to take over, so that's, oh man, oh, yeah, yeah. you got me. Uh, I'm not going to speculate right now, though. Yeah, there's going to be. <laughs> That's oh, that's exciting. That's super exciting. And I know that you have more cool stuff coming. Uh, the the thing that I'm most excited to talk about with you. I love the Punisher. I love Kingpin, but dude, you're you're bringing Hawkeye back. Yeah. West Coast Avengers. Uh, that was brilliant. I loved you know sure. how we you know that was fun. But there's no more West Coast Avengers. So that no means more there's West no more Hawkeye. Yeah. So, until until. Chatter <laughs> first. Uh, Chatter first. Hawkeye Freefall number one. It's me and Otto Schmidt, um, who uh, I feel like Otto's done a lot of stuff at DC. He did Green Arrow, and he's done a lot of stuff at DC. And like, uh, you know, I talk to DC fans, and I'm like, yeah, Otto Schmidt's doing Hawkeye, and their eyes go wide because people over at DC know. And I feel like Marvel folks don't know as well, like how good he is. But uh, January first, I think he's going to be like a thing people are really talking about because the book is beautiful. And um, but yeah, it's it's Clint. He's back in New York. Um, doing doing the heroic thing again in a very Clint way, sort of uh, trying his best to to do right and sort of getting in over his head and fucking things up and and getting his personal life caught up in it and and friends and relationships and and just like you know I I, I actually pitched the book and when I pitched the book I was like it's called Hawkeye it's not funny anymore was my original pitch title <laughs> it's it's about it's about Clint like taking things too far it's taking a joke too far so it's it's clint and the hood going toe to toe and the hood is a villain who like you know it's just a little outside his weight class it's just a little bit of a bigger bad than hawkeye should be taken solo and he's just wants to take the hood down and make his life miserable and 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 screw with him and and everyone around him is kind of like this is not a good idea, man. <laughs> like you are, you're going too far. And, and in classic, like, you know, the reason I love Hawkeye is like, he's very, he, I find him to be one of the most human relatable Marvel superheroes. He doesn't, Agreed. you know, he doesn't have a magic weapon. He wasn't granted anything by a God. He's not a mutant. He's just a guy who was like, you know, he had a rough childhood. He's, he's, you know, he's deaf. He's, 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 a he's just really good at one thing and and like he made a lot of mistakes when he was young and he's just trying to make right and help people like captain america was there for him and looked out for him and put him on the right path and now he wants to do that for people and uh you know i i, I love that angle on him but because of how human he is he is valuable and he makes these mistakes and he and he fucks things up and he you know he wears his heart on his sleeve and he's passionate and you know he's so driven and passionate in a way that like it becomes dangerous and and so all of that like i wanted to play with and so that's sort of what this book is about is like what happens when hawkeye who's famous for rushing into things and charging in head first like what happens when he just goes too far and and screws up and uh you know uh, he he's too proud to ask for help and he's too you know too stubborn to ask for help and he's too much uh his own guy and yeah i mean i think it's 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 playing with the character but it's it's also just funny and you know we tried to make it really fun and funny and it's you know a return to superhero superheroes and you know there's a ton of guest stars in it and spider-man's in it and daredevil's in it and bucky and black widow and um a ton of other people and it's 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 awesome and then we have this other element which is you know when hawkeye died a bunch of years ago he came back and he he assumed the Ronin identity and he wore a mask and he was in hiding and no one knew he was Ronin and it was a secret. And um, now he's running around as Hawkeye and there's a new Ronin. And mm -hmm. uh, the new Ronin is not necessarily a good guy. <laughs> and the new Ronin is kind of dangerous and hurting people. And, uh, you know, it's, his first move is attacking uh, a bunch of federal agents. And... Uh, 
and everyone is kind of like looking to Hawkeye to be like, is this you? Are you doing this? And he's, it's, it's not him. And he's frustrated and he's, and he's already doing stuff that he shouldn't be doing. And so there's too many eyes on him. And so it's, it's all very complicated, but who the new Ronin is relates to his past and what he's doing going forward. I don't know. It's, I'm really excited about it. I'm sort of yammering on about it, but it, it is a book I'm so excited about. And I think, uh, you know, it feels a little different than a lot of the other stuff I've done at Marvel in a way that I'm really proud of, and I think people will hopefully dig. Well, it's it's time Hawkeye gets some redemption. I know it's uh, there's, it's, and I have a feeling this is going to be one of those runs that's going to be revered up to the, with the, the the fractions. You know, I mean, this is going to be. I, I have a whole lot of faith because I know the level of humor you could bring, and I also, I mean, I just know your range as a writer, and this is a very deep character. He is, he's yeah. very layered. There's, so I, th- I think. Really, is is a perfect suit for you as far as yeah, uh, I, I know. I, I just it was all too perfect when you and I knew you were announcing something and then you announced it and I was totally left field. I was like Hawkeye, oh shit, Hawkeye, Matthew Rosenberg. This is too fucking perfect. This is low hanging fruit, man. Where's this been? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something I wanted to do. I did the Tales of Suspense book a uh, year and a half ago. That was Hawkeye and Bucky. And as soon as I came out of that, I was like, yeah, I'd like to do more Hawkeye. And they were like, yes. But then with uncanny x-men and punisher got extended right. and and i was like i don't have time to give it the attention i wanted and so now i'm really like focused on that book and um giving it sort of the love it needs and and uh yeah i'm really excited about it it's something that uh that i i i really think uh i don't know it's weird to say like i i, I love all the marvel books and i think marvel's putting out some of the best books they've ever put out now and and i'm i love everything and i'm i'm really happy to be doing a book that feels like pretty different <laughs> on the shelf and that's not meant to diminish what anyone else is doing i just i just no, like no. being that book and i think hawkeye is that book in a lot of ways it feels like a little odder and a little a li- we're going a little different place than other people are going and that's fun but well that, that's once again i'm gonna use the word exciting but it is it, it's it's incredibly exciting um how how f- is this something that, like a maxi series or is this something that you want to do ongoing potentially or just kind of see you know, how it goes it's uh i pitched it as six issues i was like i have a six issue story for hawkeye um marvel was kind of like hawkeye's hawkeye's a you know He's not Captain America. It's not a character that always has to be on the shelf. It's not, you know, uh, Spider-Man where there's always going to be a book. And so it's, um, we're sort of playing it by ear. Uh, if we wrap at six, like, that's what I intended to do. But, you know, there's a chance we'll keep going if people are excited about it and, cool. and are into it. Um, I have Hawkeye stories going forward that I've talked to them about that they're very excited about. And I may find someplace else to do those if we don't do more Hawkeye. And I may put those on the shelf for a little bit or someone else take them but actually like you know this feels it it always feels like a cop-out because people are like well how many issues is it And i'm like i don't actually know like we don't know we're playing it by ear the first arc is six issues um and that might be the whole story that was the whole story i set out to tell and then we you know when the when people got really excited about it marvel said well if you had to tell more what would it be and i told them and they were like we like that but it is you know at the end of the day it's all sales driven it's not uh, if people are buying the first issue and and buying the second issue, then yeah, they'll keep going for a while. If people are like, no, this is cool, you know, like sort of a more more what the reaction that people expect for Hawkeye, then then we'll be done at six and it'll be a, a mini series. But uh, you know, it's a mini series that I pitched and I'm really excited about it. So right on. Well, I know I, I even if it does end in six, I know it's going to be a uh, six issues of brilliance. But uh, I wouldn't be mad to to see Hawkeye as an ongoing character, man. Because I mean, all it takes is one great writer to do the to do a character perfectly to inspire everyone to just want to keep reading it for to be the next Iron Man. Iron yeah. Man wasn't always a character that always needed to be on the shelf. Sure. So I mean, it, it, it's it, this could uh, I I think. I, you're in. Uh, I think Hawkeye fans are in good hands, man. I, I do. I hope so. I hope. I hope people dig it. Um, you know, we're a little weirder than. You know, Otto's a little more stylized than I think a lot of Marvel fans are used to. We're doing a little weirder. It's a little more funny. It's a little crazier in some ways. But I, I, I think. I think if people give us a shot, like it's a. It's definitely a love letter to the Marvel universe and and Clint's place in the Marvel universe. And it's you know. It's a love letter to the old, you know, West Coast Avengers books of the of the mm-hmm. '80s and the old, you know, the Hawkeye origin stuff. And it's it's a lot of stuff that I love. And so, you know, like we're not trying to like do something weird and different 
that is totally alienating. I think for old school fans who like Hawkeye, I think there'll be a lot to love in this too. So, um, yeah, I, I just hope people check it out. Um, I'm really excited about the first six issues for sure. Let's. Uh, I, I I don't know anybody that is. I know that I uh, I put in a good word. I'm real close. My my local comic book store just so happens to be the world's largest. It's Mile High Comics. I put um, in a real good word. I, it, it, he asked me because he knows I follow the the community real closely, and you know they're always asking me, okay, what's the one we should kind of up our uh, easily Hawkeye um, easily. I mean, this is because it could be a book that you know some may if they're not following all the hype, they might think, oh, another Hawkeye book. You know, yeah. but when you know you look at it and they <laughs> Matthew Rosenberg's writing it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I'm excited. It's like uh, uh, I like sort of the underdog characters and the underdog yes. books, and and Hawkeye is definitely that. And that for me is like, you know, that's a big part of the book is that Hawkeye is the Avenger that people forget is an Avenger, <laughs> and they're kind of like, right. You know, it's a running gag in the book that people he'll be like I'm an Avenger and they'll be like Are you though? And like that's a <laughs> constant joke throughout the book. So I you know I I uh, you know but but Hawkeye has some of the best most passionate fans and like you know I I uh, Kelly Thompson who wrote Hawkeye before me and is a very close friend of mine and she uh, gave him a great voice man I I loved I loved Kelly's voice for Clint I, I really I, did uh, she she killed it for sure and kelly was just like you know the hawkeye fans are great and like she's like i i i've never felt more loved and welcomed than than hawkeye fans and uh you know she's like, she brought know, me into being a hawkeye fan she um, did she brought me into reading hawkeye that's for sure and that's that's why that's all the more reason i have so much more excitement about this it's because yeah. Uh, yeah i mean yeah she she's the one that convinced me that hawkeye is amazing illustrated yeah. Uh, I was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. On every level. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the the that Kelly was the person that I was most nervous about of my of my sort of friend circle, and uh, she she read it yesterday and like wrote me a letter yeah. like That's she wrote awesome. a note and was just like it's so good, dude. And I was like I was literally like I saw her note come in after I knew she was reading it and I saw it coming and I was like oh god oh god and and like you know I'm so close to Kelly and and I love her so much and and she would very much. Uh, you know, we have that relationship where if it sucked, she'd be like, "Dude, this sucks." <laughs> and I was, you know, and, and it's helpful. And it, and and she said that to me about stuff before, and I've said that to her about stuff before. Where I've just been like, "This doesn't work," and she's like, "I know." And you know, we we're just really like uh, honest with each other. And she was like, "Dude, I love it so much." And I was like, so relieved. It was like meant as much to me as as Alana, my editor, being like, "I loved it." I was like, uh, as relieved when Kelly loved it. I was like, "Oh, because Kelly's like pedigree on the book is is very important to me," and so. That's uh well that's well I mean I approve if that means anything. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> um uh well uh man I know that uh, man it's a shame that we got to wrap up. Uh, yeah, soon. I know you got some stuff to do. Um well that just gives me all the uh, that means hopefully we could do this again. I've got all yeah. new fresh questions and stuff. Um but before I go I do have to ask 2020 Rosenberg what can we expect that you're allowed to announce? <sighs> um. Well, in February, I'm doing Force Works for Marvel. Yes, yes, man. Kind of... I'm so excited about that. Oh, yeah. War Machine. Oh, I get a Rosenberg voice on War Machine. That's so yeah. I, I, it's War Machine, U.S. Agent, Mockingbird, and Quake. Um, sort of a team I, I completely picked myself. They were just like, what do you want it to be? And those were my four, and I got all four of them, so I'm very excited about that. But it's, uh, it's tying into Dan Slott's Iron Man 2020, which is a big awesome event and i you know dan walked me through what he was doing and i just i loved it so much and i was like oh man i wish i could do, do something with this because this is so fun and then they were like yeah we're looking for a force works book and i just jumped at that and um so i'm really excited about that that's february it's just three issues me and juan and ramirez but uh it's it's really well, that's fun. exciting too I, I love ramirez's work yeah he's great this is great oh Oh. Um, yeah he, he went right off annihilation uh alpha into it so um yeah, I've done a bunch of stuff with Juan, and he worked on X Men for a little bit, and uh, he worked on my Secret Warriors run for a bit, and yeah, he just gets better with every issue, and the Force Park stuff is, I think, going to really blow people's minds. And then the only other thing I have that I can announce, I have a bunch of other stuff I'm working on, but um, that I can talk about is uh, Tyler Boss, who did uh, Four Kids Walking to a Bank with me. Um, there you go. Uh, we have a new book coming out from Image uh, next year. He's doing another thing uh, that I'm very excited about, but we're doing a book together called What's the Furthest Place from Here, uh, oh. which is a, like a really dark post-apocalyptic coming-of-age story, sort of like 
dark sci-fi kids in a after the end of the world living in a record store kind of thing um and i'm really excited about it uh we sort of announced it a while ago and have been very slowly i've been slowly working on it and um he's been doing some other stuff but uh yeah i'm really excited for people to check it out well uh you're uh, <laughs> i always love it when a, a predominantly marvel creator goes off and does some indie work mm-hmm. because i mean i i love the indies just as much as anything else and uh, four kids walk into a bank is once again we don't have time to talk about it, but uh, uh, but that's 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 for another that's for another conversation because um, I mean maybe around the time that uh, say the title of this other one again uh, it's called what's the furthest place from here what's the furthest place from here all right cool um, yeah, so yeah, I, I'm so excited out and do do a bunch of press for it when it's coming out so like yeah we should definitely definitely talk again then. yeah remember cheers to comics for sure I'm gonna well, I mean I, I, uh, you, you'll be getting the message from me first, I'm sure. <laughs> um, well, like I said, I could I could talk to you forever, man. I am a true fan. This is a this is a milestone for this podcast. We've got we've got a Marvel creator on here. We could check one off the list. Not just any Marvel creator. We've got one of the Marvel creators. I mean, you've you've got a heavy footprint here in your last three and a half four years in the industry, and it's highly highly respected. I mean, uh, definitely by me. I don't know anyone, not in my circle, that talks poorly upon you, man. You're, it's been a, it's been an honor, and what you've done yep. for, you know, the, the the comic book universe, the Marvel universe has been, it's been an absolute treasure. Whether you've uh, killed, and it, it's a way you've killed them, <laughs> or didn't kill them, <laughs> or uh, I mean, because you, you, you do it so, so poetically, man. Even in Punisher, the way, the deaths of in that were just, uh it. it I may have I'm, I may have welled up a couple of times. Yeah, I mean you know how to bring it, dude. You know how to bring it. <laughs> Thanks, man. That means a lot, seriously. Um, but uh, yeah, no, you are welcome back anytime, sir. And it's 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 been an honor. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Cheers, man. Bye. <laughs>